it's uh, uh, wonderful to be here with Jello Biafra. Uh, my name is Johannes Grenzfurtner. Uh, I'm an artist and, and filmmaker, and I founded uh, an art and theory group called Monochrome many, many years ago. And uh, I'm the official host of the B3 Biennial uh, videocast series. It's called In Depth which is hard to pronounce uh, for German speakers with the TH and all that it's stuff. It's not as hard to pronounce as Grenzfurtner. It is true. It is true. I mean, I never told you maybe, but but uh, Grenzfurtner in uh, uh, in English, uh, it's uh, border forder because Grenze means border and a foot is like a shallow creek of Ford, like your wonderful oh, okay. president. You know? <laughs> wow. Ford. So wow. I'm Johnny Border Forder in English. <laughs> well, I mean, like fording a stream, crossing a stream. You know, when people do that across the Rio Grande from Mexico, then Donald Trump attacks them and throws them in concentration camps. Oh, yeah. There is a lot to talk about, especially in your <laughs> outfit. <laughs> so it's great having you. And uh, so the great thing about the B3 Biennial is that we have many people from many different fields uh, of creative work. Uh, if I would have to summarize your creative work, it is actually, um, let's call it art crime or creative crime. <laughs> you know you i know where you got that from that was my first search and destroy interview right yes yes yeah absolutely. I, I mean I, I i i love creative crime i mean it doesn't even have to be illegal i mean the best prank since veil and research put out those pranks books i have ever heard of happened to donald trump last summer when he was finally going to come out and COVID sickness be damn, he's going to start his little miniature Walt Disney meets Nuremberg kind of rallies or something. And um, he's going to go to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And they say, oh, yeah, they we're expecting a million people. We've called all these cops off. Do they all have to be there for a million people are going to show up to see Donald Trump. And it turned out and only 6,000 people showed up. And it turned out the reason was all these kids in their early teens on TikTok all communicated with each other and told the Trump campaign they were coming. And it was a free rally, so you didn't have to pay for anything. So they all committed to coming and maybe even gave names or fake names. I don't know. And had the Trump campaign convinced that a million people were gonna be there. And you can imagine how this felt for somebody as vain as Donald Trump. They even had another outside festival stage for him to talk to 40,000 people who couldn't get into the 20,000 seat basketball arena. And then I turn on the TV, find oh God, do I have to see any of this? I guess I have to. And there's a camera on the stage outside and there's nobody there. And then it turns out there's these people scattered all over, few lonely ones in the rafters in this mostly empty basketball arena. Oh my God, yeah, that's- uh, He fired that, that... his campaign manager the next day. And that dude had been a totally loyal dick sucker back in 2016 too, crediting himself with being the internet wizard that helped make Donald Trump our fake president. I mean, the real internet wizards are the ones who monkeyed with the vote in 29 states in the interstate cross-check program that kicked all these people off the voting rolls. It wasn't Putin. It wasn't even Jim Crow. It was a bigger thing than Jim Crow called the interstate cross-check program. And there's a whole documentary movie about this that Greg Pallast made. You may know about him, a BBC journalist, sometimes Nation or Rolling Stone, who exposed how George W. Bush stole the uh, 2000 election and all, and um, called the book The Best Democracy Money Can Buy. Then he made a movie called The Best Democracy Money Can Buy right before the 2016 election, documenting how this interstate cross-check program invented by a guy named Chris Kobach, a right-wing wunderkind who we have not heard the last of, from Kansas, he got 29 of the 50 states to give him their entire database of voters. Then he made it into one big database and put it into his cross-check program to red flag any matching names. And Palast actually was able to look at the program. I don't know how he hacked in there, but he was able to do it. And it turned out they weren't looking at middle names and social security numbers to make sure they didn't make a mistake. They were matching up 
names that weren't even quite the same, but is programmed to, like, to take everybody whose name was Washington and kick them off the voter rolls because most people named Washington are African-American. And if your name was uh, Jose Gonzalez or something, all 5,000 of you were kicked off the voter rolls in 2016 and you didn't even know it. And that oh. is the real way Trump stole 2016. And not only that, but several crazy Tea Party senators, including Ron Johnson from Wisconsin, who's been in the news a lot lately for how stupid he is and stuff, um, they were all supposed to lose and they got back in just in time to vote three more right wing Christian supremacist extremists onto the Supreme Court. And so uh, the interstate cross check program, it's worth trying to interview Greg Palast about it sometime. We know him, we can find him if you want. Absolutely. Uh, but by the way, your cat is stealing the interview. <laughs> Oh, really? I thought I thought all she put in there was her tail briefly. <laughs> the tail, but but the but the, the cat is typing or something. So sometimes you can you can hear it. In right, the she was trying to but it chew, doesn't matter. Trying it doesn't to matter. chew the corner off a bank statement. I'm going to have to move the whole computer to pick her up and put her on camera. But uh, it will be. <laughs> it will, I don't know. Oh, now she's going to chew on the com moon unit. What are you doing? All yeah. right. Well, I mean, that's that's uh, that's the this side not effects be of the COVID. first interview she's done this to, including a uh, a uh, you know a, a screen reading as they call them now, a script reading of a movie. I hopefully going to be in the one of those Night of the Living Dead ones called Spawn of the Living Dead, and I'm the Mad Doctor guy. Oh, I can totally see that. I can absolutely. And my wife see that. is Adrian Barbeau. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. But let let's jump back uh, to to like many 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 years ago to the 1970s because uh, I'm very much interested because it was like you you you're you're one or two generations older than than I am so I never I never experienced uh, punk or punk rock like the first wave of punk rock I was even a kid like during probably the second wave so I mean when I when I was old enough to understand what punk is and what punk could be, uh, that was like in the early 90s. So I, 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 I uh -huh. skipped the beginnings, yeah? But what I find really interesting and also talking, you know, like about creative crime and all that stuff, uh, what I find really interesting and I think was the really big revolution of punk is this really dirty hands-on DIY approach to things. You have a guitar, you don't know how to play, it doesn't matter, you start a punk band. You have like a, I don't know, like a cassette recorder that probably your dad bought, or you have like an eight millimeter camera that your dad bought for, you know, like recording boring things like Christmas parties or something like that. And then you just like use it and do some cool stuff with it. So in my perspective, oh, yeah. punk was always also a DIY tech revolution. Oh, oh very so much so. Sure, Sex Pistols and especially The Clash were major label from the very beginning and, you know, the machinery of the straight inner star makers and what entertainment industry was there from the beginning. But, and the Ramones of, were on a major label all along on Sire. But um, from there, so many people were inspired by punk not a movement but a culture you know i don't i've never thought of punk as a movement it's a rebel culture that inspires people to jump in do other movements and the music can help energize everybody but uh when i think of a movement i think of civil rights anti-nuclear environmental reproductive rights kill trump you know that kind of stuff <laughs> and uh you know as martin luther king said you have to have your eye on the prize what was the prize more punk i think that succeeded a little too well but it was a really really good thing and a great time to be in it because i was 18 19 years old very depressed because i loved all this cool music it seemed to be going away and all the wild shit that scared everybody with the hippies and the anti-war movement and everything else had kind of mellowed out and burned out gone away and me and my friends would look at each other we missed the 60s not even the acid's good anymore and this is boulder colorado but uh 
then when I, punk happened and I saw the Ramones in Denver, Colorado, and realized it was so simple, anybody, including me, could do it. And I could hardly wait because I knew I was a very weird person. If I could find a way to use that on stage, as well as all the method acting training I'd gone through. I played Ebenezer Scrooge once, once by the way, um, in A Christmas Carol. But anyway, um, so I thought, you know, that, that I could actually do this instead of think that I, I was born too late. I was born at the perfect time. But for me, it did. I mean, you talk about when you were coming of age in the 90s. It happened much earlier for me when I was seven years old, when my father was trying to get me to go to sleep and playing around with a, with a radio. He brought a radio into the room, played around with the stations and landed on a rock and roll station. Oh, leave it there. I like this. I like this. And then there was no stopping me. And that was 1965 when Beatlemania was still going on and local radio stations, even the commercial ones were playing local, what is now called garage rock bands, mixing them in with the national bands. And I quickly went for the heavy stuff, you know, Beatles, okay. You know, at least other people know who they are, but I went for Rolling Stones, Animals, Paul Revere and the Raiders, Music Machine and later Steppenwolf and later still Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath. And then I discovered the used record store, Independent and, and it read in a horrible rock writers review that Black Sabbath was almost as bad as the MC5. So I went and spent 50 cents on an MC5 album and my life was never the same. The Stooges followed after that, maybe even within a week or two. So, uh, the, and, and I think a lot of the punk bands were started by people who were the only Stooges fan in their town. And then they moved to bigger towns and cities and found other Stooges fans. So a lot of the comedy nominees like Stooges, Velvet Underground, um, a lot of Johnny Cash, uh, some Bowie, but not with me. And, uh, other things and, and Clash, Pistols, Body, Blah, but James Brown. I mean, the original punk record collections, it wasn't so called old school. We were just blowing up the school. There was no school yet. There were no formulas to copy. And that's why a lot of those bands sounded so different from each other back then. It's because we all kind of had to invent everything. And then in San Francisco, the scene was so small when I moved there that the peer pressure was not for all the bands to sound the same. That happened with hardcore. No, peer pressure was that all the bands had to sound different from each other because otherwise the audience would get bored and not care about you, especially when most of the audience was the people in the other bands. Oh yeah, absolutely. I but mean, back to your original question, I do think the other great gift, maybe even the most important gift the punk explosion gave the world not only did rock the spirit of rock and roll come back the very idea of putting out your own record came back and the growth of independent labels or people just do it knowing they could do it themselves but also independent media homemade punk zines people go down to a xerox place and make a few copies staple them and sell them and then they'd go make another one and then somebody else would read it and then go make their own. So it brought back independent media, which eventually mushroomed into independent broadcasting. And then with the internet, my old saying, don't hate the media, become the media. Well, now in a way we can all become the media and have all become the media, but we still need to be very, very conscious of not believing every last item of media we find on the internet. I haven't died in a while, but there has been problems with that in the past. And you take it away, that thus the No More Selfies song in my new album, Tea Party Revenge Porn. But when you, when you take it away from the personal stupid stuff to people getting fired from their jobs because somebody else posted lies about them on the internet or people having their savings ripped off because of phony stock tips and things, or of course, stalking and cyberbullying, which has even led to some suicides. And I also, I really don't think anybody, let alone somebody 11 years old or even 50 years old should be under this pressure where now you are who you market yourself to be. 
You must market, you must be conscious of your personal brand and sell yourself at all times and sell yourself so that other people will like you on Facebook and the right people will like you on Facebook or you're nobody. Maybe let, let's tie that story in with your previous uh, reflection about Trump and what's going on in, in the political sphere in the macro political sphere, let's call it. Uh, because what I see or what I find most horrid is that there is this general belief or this general idea, of course, that you need to fight the system. But uh, even people like Donald Trump uh, claim that they are the non-elite that they are fighting the systems, that, that Trump <laughs> is the big underdog. Well, uh, and suddenly this whole, yeah, the whole story lot. of like, the whole story of counterculture is suddenly turned completely around and people use, you know, like the language of counterculture, but are enormously mainstream. So what, what's well, your take well, on that? Well, um, do you know what the onion is? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, a satirical American uh, news site and stuff with all this obviously fake news on it and stuff that is very funny at times. But um, <laughs> like when Bush stole the 2000 election, they wrote that Milosevic was sending some observers and that Timothy McVeigh was urging calm and everything. But, um, you know, stuff like that. And, uh, but, so I've always described, say, Fox News as imagine if there was a right-wing onion and people actually believed it. And of course, now there is a huge, huge problem of, with this that goes totally back to don't believe everything you see on the internet and social media. But of course, a lot of people, you know, they, the, the algorithms with Facebook and the others are if it bleeds, it leads. You want to make people worked up. You want to make them angry because then they'll stay on Facebook longer and consume more of this stuff and be more easily easy to manipulate and put somebody in who will make Mark Zuckerberg pay less taxes. And so, again, I keep stressing to people in my spoken word shows and in song that um, the only way we can fight back about this now is number one, grow better bullshit detectors. We have to have our antennae out there, well-developed to find it and sense it as soon as it appears and show other people how to grow their own better bullshit detectors. You know, my example I use is don't just listen to blog, don't just question bloggers, question me. You know, don't just question authority, question bloggers, that sort of thing. And, um, you know, people just have to be as cynical as we are about what people try to feed us in all the different sources of media and information we have now. And I don't think anybody should be allowed to graduate from high school, as they call it in America, before university, unless they can pass a class on media literacy. But we don't have those classes, and there's probably a reason for that. But um, so we have to teach it ourselves, both through our own media and one-on-one -on -one with people, with children, with uh 50 year old children, you name it, you know, if you're with them and they, you see something that's obviously fake and obviously either lying or just plain stupid, point it out to them, get them to laugh at it, not just be disgusted, but laugh at it. And then the looking glass is broken and they can never go back and automatically believe what they are fed on Fox or Twitter or anything again. Yeah, uh, the, the wonderful Tom Lehrer said that we are in a world uh, where satire is not possible anymore because Kissinger uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize, and that <laughs> and that stuff is I know like that's fifty years ago, you know, <laughs> uh, or forty years ago, uh, and uh, but still it's so weird for me to see that one of the biggest growing underground movements is the flat earthers. 
And of course, I mean <laughs> everything like just like I I I I get I get goosebumps I that there I wrote is a, a social the, movement. I, about I, lo- I wrote a letter to the original Flat Earth Society way back in the eighties, pretending to believe them and ask them to send stuff. And sure enough, I got a brochure and then a letter from the guy who ran it all and may have had only two or three other members who actually believed it at the time, but it was so paranoid. Well, thank you for your letter, but by this phrase, this is, I'm not really sure what you mean. I don't know if you're trying to do things to me, blah, blah, blah. And then he rants and raves in his literature about grease ballers and how we have to fight all these grease ballers and show that this is the truth. <laughs> grease ballers. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, of course, the, the QAnon conspiracy shit has even hit germany now in a big way apparently oh yeah absolutely and all, is, all i can oh, say is oh. you know all i can think of is think of okay who is q really is it donald trump or is it donald trump jr or is it both of them and a few other kushner and bannon and the others just making up this shit and laughing and posting it this it's has so weird, to be yeah. it has to be a prank but of course, it's by somebody who isn't one of our people who did it. Yeah, and their I think aim, the main course, problem is, is uh, you know, more and more out and out fascism and more and more violent out and out fascism for non believers of Q. I mean, what was it, the QAnon shaman that they arrested after he walked through the Capitol building with those horns and the spear, disgracing Guar in the worst way possible? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is uh, yeah really astounding to me that uh, that we we're at a point. It's it's not about culture anymore. It's about like meta culture and meta culture and, and and culture reflecting on culture. And I mean, QAnon is a fascist movement. At the same time, like. I don't know like how people felt in Germany in the 1920s and 1930s when fascism started. Did they have the same feeling of like, look at that shit. They are so stupid. It's so just like incredibly well, Some people bad. must have, but then the, the reason fascism and Hitler took hold, and this is where it gets really dangerous, is because a lot of people were desperate. And they felt helpless, they felt angry, they felt heartbroken, they were so broke, they couldn't buy a loaf of bread without a wheelbarrow full of money at one point. I mean, this is the mistake when you kick somebody's ass in a war as big as World War I, and then you don't help the actual people afterwards. You know, eventually they get very, very, very angry, and here comes the guy with all the answers. You know, I just saw, I wish I had it right where I could read it to you, but it's in another part of the house. Um, That comic Doonesbury used a clipping straight out of the New York Times from 19, I don't know, 23 or 25, a tiny little thing, Hitler released from prison after the beer hall putsch. And, um, you know, know, fascist or whatever leader Adolf Hitler was released, he's expected to retire to a quiet life back in Austria now that he's been defeated. And then a Doonesbury character is at the bottom saying, hey, and he even got a book deal. So (laughs) so Hitler Hitler moved to Florida, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. I mean, another example of that actually is that movie I was in that we put the DVD out of called Terminal City Ricochet. And the dictator of Terminal City finally is brought down. But then after there's the credits and everything, there he is back. Maybe he just got out of jail or he's still in there. And I've written a new book. And I'm planning my comeback this way and this way and that way. Then pokes the TV camera's lens out with an umbrella. And that's the real end of the movie. Yeah. And But how uh, how can we... basically. Basically, uh, well, go ahead and ask your question. I'm losing my train of thought. I knew what I was going to say, and I forgot. No go ahead. But I mean, it, it's so hard to you talking about the bullshit detector, kind of like trying to find the truth out there. But most people are not interested in detecting bullshit. They just want to be reaffirmed in That's their beliefs. That's why systems. you have to make it fun. You know, I mean, I mean, unfortunately, the 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 main outlet 
for people with, with who know just have enough of a bullshit detector, little nubs of them, that uh, they realize something is really wrong and they're really getting fucked. And so the very corporations and wealthy people who are often right-wing fascists who are fucking them spend billions and billions and billions of dollars to steer their rage in a non-productive direction. So they let off steam through hate of brown-skinned Mexican immigrants or uh, black people who vote or uh, now Trump's even built it up enough where they hate anybody who disagrees with them and, and stuff. And it's really, really getting nasty and violent out there in a way I have never seen, not even with Nixon was it this bad? I thought Richard Nixon was the most divisive person, president I'd ever been through. And after what happened on January 6th and other smaller incidents in other places, including the plot to, by some of these neo-Nazi militia guys to kidnap the governor of Michigan and behead her on camera for making them wear masks and things and post that on the net. And some of the people who were arrested in that plot got right back out on bail and they saw them in DC on January 6th. So uh, it, oh my God. It, the police cooperating with these people is part of it. In that sense, it's like the Golden Dawn in Greece who are one of the more violent fascist parties in uh, Europe. I mean, there's another song on the new album called Satan's Comb Over. And both that and the actual song, Tea Party Revenge Porn, were written before Trump and Crosscheck tipped the 2016 election and allowed the theft and all. But it was not specifically about Trump. Satan's Comb Over is a worldwide phenomenon, a worldwide menace. And Trump came late to the game. He came long after um, Jean-Marie and his daughter and Hélène Le Pen and the National Front in France or Golden Dawn in Greece where the three top leaders just got convicted of murder and of course uh, Alternative for Deutschland, Brexit and the really frightening ones in places like the Philippines or India or Brazil. It's all Satan's comb over. It's like, you know, the uber wealthy people all over the world decided we have had enough of this Occupy shit, this Green Party shit, these progressives gaining power, these ideas coming into the mainstream. We have to crush these motherfuckers now. Yeah, Austria was very helpful with all of that because oh, uh, yeah. because we have we we had Jörg Haider who is dead in the meantime, but he kind of like created the blueprint, what I would call of right wing populist movements and he came into power in 1986 which was a bad year anyways because the challenger blew up and chernobyl blew up and also your Haider came to power in the freedom party in austria and, and he Kennedy's really you can broke up <laughs> yeah <laughs> dead kennedy's and crass and black flag all announced the breakups within about a week of each other Oh my God, 1986, what a year. I was 11 years old. I was just like, uh, not really getting most of that. I remember, like what I remember is that I was uh, uh, swimming in the Danube uh, and there was this like really nice uh, warm rain and uh, it was probably very radioactive because all that <laughs> stuff came over from, from Chernobyl like, uh, because oh a couple of, it was a couple of days after Chernobyl happened. Wow. Uh, but I mean, it is so interesting. I mean, swimming in the Danube alone, I mean, what kind of shit's in the water there? I, it's not that bad, actually. It's not that bad. It was like one of these like sidearms uh, of, of, of the Danube. I think like in the real actual Danube, you can't really swim. You would probably drown very fast. It's Were a very, the current is really, really strong. Oh, I <laughs> but, see. but I mean, the 1980s were like in general, like a very uh, uh, interesting era because all the stuff that happened, all the, all the, uh, the direction that like society is taking right now, uh, the foundations were laid back then. I mean, if you, if you see what, what kind of damage Reagan, for example, did, If you, you can track a lot of the problems we have nowadays back to uh, decisions that the Reagan administration made in the early 1980s. Well, I went through Richard Nixon, too, and I trace some of that to him. The stepping stones, I guess. First, you yeah, need a, I mean, you need a Nixon I, I, to get I, a Reagan. I have three areas of trivia in my brain that things kind of 
stay there, even if I don't want them to. Even if I pay attention to football or baseball, I start remembering all this stuff. But the other big ones are music and white collar crime. So when Reagan started picking his cabinet, oh, there's an unindicted Watergate criminal. Oh, there's another one. Oh, there's one of the people who just loved napalming children in Vietnam. Oh, here's this fox for this hen house. And then, of course, the Countergate criminals rose again in George W. Bush's administration. And then uh, one of them even met, was Obama's defense secretary afterwards, Robert Gates. You know, a lot of these crooks, I remember them from before. I knew who Paul Manafort was. I didn't know who Roger Stone was, but I knew who a lot of the other ones were. And of course, I knew who Trump was, but had no idea he was such a mad megalomaniac fascist until he ran for president. And I'm not sure he even became one until he decided this was the way to make himself president. I mean, he was always a really bad racist. And he was always um, really, really angry at any law of any kind that regulated business or made him pay taxes. So there was that as far as any kind of real vision went. But um, I, I, I mean, yeah, it is a unique phenomenon. I can hardly wait for him to die. But because uh, they're, they're not going to be able to replace him with anybody like that. That senator who, who went from criticizing him and saying he wasn't half as worried about the damage Trump would do to the Republican Party, but the damage that would happen if he actually won, that was Lindsey Graham, the smooth-talking, gentlemanly Southern senator who now will do anything Trump tells him to and stuff and is one of his leading uh, public lapdogs. And, uh, and, he, and he, he recently said he thought this was favorable that there's real magic with him. Even now there's real magic. He's like a one of a kind combination of Jesse Helms, one of the worst racist senators in American history and Ronald Reagan and P.T. Barnum. You know, the big circus carny from the 19th century and all who even put an old woman on display claiming she was over a hundred years old and was George Washington's slave. And then when she died, he exhibited her corpse saying the same thing. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, no, you'd find him fascinating. He was not only that kind of a huckster, he was the most successful one of his day, probably even more than Buffalo Bill. So as a creative uh, art crime uh, aficionado, well, yeah, I mean, I got to say this about creative crime. I explain yeah. it this way, is crime is the last unfo unspoiled art form left on earth. Nobody at art school tells you the right way to do commit crimes or the right way to package your crimes and prevent yourself so that rich people will give you gallery shows and stuff. No, it's all free form. So what kind of creative crime do we need nowadays? in the post-punk, maybe pre-punk era. So what, what would you like to see to happen right now? Well, I, I would like to see a revival of all the workplace sabotage that went on back then, which you can easily do in, in, in you know, a, a, a shit tech job too. You know, just circulating memos and put the supervisor's name on it or even somebody like a Zuckerberg announcing that every that that almost 80% of the workforce will be laid off at the end of the day and not say who which means everyone will stop working to talk about it the rest of the day and could cost the company a hell of a lot of money or just putting out of order signs and key pieces of equipment or sending out emails calling a supervisor's meeting and a boss's meeting at the certain time and then they all go there and nobody knows why they were called there and they waste their afternoon all kinds of fun ways. I mean, a prank a day keeps the dog leash away. And uh, even if it's as simple as uh, looking at the other, the other, you know, businessy commuters in the train on the other tracks that's going the other direction and you're both stopped, you could just start making faces at them or something in the window. And uh, sometimes, at least in America, you'll have some redneck pounding on the glass and the other side getting all mad and threatening you and stuff. Just things to keep you sane. 
you know, and uh, try, uh, I mean, uh, another couple of my other favorite, favorite pranks of years past that could easily be redone in a new inventive form for new original crime as, a, as an art form. Um, a friend of mine who you may know too, you know his band, I know, he doesn't want me to say his name when he, when, he, when he talks about this, which surprises me, but I can tell it to you anyway. He's one of the people who came out of that scene in Aberdeen, Washington and the surrounding towns where Nirvana, Melvin's and several other bands came from when they moved to Olympia or moved to Seattle or anyway. Um, and one and and because there were so many farms around these towns there were farm kids in the schools and one day a farm kid brought a stillborn calf a baby cow who had been born dead to school and then they went down to mcdonald's and they put the stillborn calf in a women's stall in the women's bathroom the toilet and then just hung out across the street waiting to see what happened. One police car screeched, then another screeched, then another screech. Oh my I God. hadn't laughed about a prank that hard since the one that happened many years ago on the Bay Bridge that goes across San Francisco Bay from San Francisco to the other side where Oakland and Berkeley are. And we were practicing on the Oakland side of the bay that night and um, got a call from Ray who lived in the East Bay, that's his name, saying, uh, you know, forget about practice, the Bay Bridge is completely jammed in both directions. No cars are moving. It's been stopped cold for hours. The streets are backing up too. And, uh, you know, nobody's going to make it to anything. And it turned out what had happened was that in the morning, a barrel, a big, you know, trash barrel, chemical size barrel fell off the back of a truck and popped open on the Bay Bridge and all this white powder fat spilled out. And they didn't know what it was. So out was all the hazmat and dangerous chemical removal team. For all they knew, this could be toxic poison or plutonium or whatever. And the bridge stopped cold and tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people never made it to work that day. And keep in mind, San Francisco was where the worldwide headquarters of Bank of America was then. Chevron, Bechtel Construction, who had a, who kind of owned Ronald Reagan and other things like that. They, uh, nobody showed up for work. Who knows how many millions of dollars of worker productivity was lost because of one simple barrel falling off a truck. They finally got the test back from the lab. It was flour. Leading uh, me to suspect that it was intentional. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, there, I mean, there, there are used many to be a guy named put... Dick Tuck who would follow Richard Nixon around, you know, because Nixon was such an asshole and had such a bad temper and always childish tantrums at the media, even more so than Trump and other things. So back in the day when president, people running for president had their own train and would stop in all these towns and give little speeches on the back of the train and then the train would move on. And he got Nixon's train to pull out of the station right as his speech started. I don't know how many times in one day he did that and what the other ones were, but this guy had very, guy Dick Tuck had publicly dedicated his life to pranks on Richard Nixon. <laughs> I mean. So that in that spirit, the TikTok kids who ruined Trump's rally and there was a picture of him when his when 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 he got back to Washington D.C. that night, and he his had tie. his shirt open, his tie. He just looked like an absolute wreck, staggering out of the bar after he just lost a fight with somebody half his size. Oh yeah, and uh, uh, I'm very I'm very interested in seeing like how he 
is trying to keep uh, the power and and uh, consolidate his uh, allies uh, in 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 the GOP scene. We well, realize uh, he his motive may only be money. You go to the Trump 2020 campaign website, it's still up. You can buy all kinds of things, even more than the merch stand at heavy metal shows or something. There's an insane amount of swag. Even a t-shirt called Mount Trumpmore with Trump's face added on to Mount Rushmore, bigger and more toward the front so you can barely see George Washington anymore. And they're selling those along with all these other shirts and cups and beer can openers and everything else. And there's a whole section of Trump 2024 merchandise too. Those big flags, you can get your shirts, you can get all kinds of things. I think he's just trying to sell more and more of that and just take all the money. He also recently put a statement saying that the Republican party could not use his name to fundraise for the party, which they just laughed at and kept doing it. But he was saying, and then he, so, so then he put out the word to everybody who still looks at his social media, don't give any money to the Republican party, give it all to me. He he's not gonna spend that money running for anything or helping anybody running for anything else. He's gonna spend it on himself. And he owes so many people so much money, he may have to. I mean, it's not just the uh, ruling from the TAC, you know, from the IRS, that his claiming $75 million off of taxes one year was bullshit and he had to pay it, which has now gone up to $100 million because of interest. They're going to rule on that for the final time this year. And if they send him a bill, he has to pay up $100 million to the government almost immediately or they'll start seizing his property. Then there's the $300 million he borrowed from Deutsche Bank, probably $400 million by now, and he never paid them a dime. That's the way he has always worked. He's no good at business. Once he couldn't blow his father's money anymore, he started taking out loans from banks. And, oh, I'm the famous Donald Trump. Give me hundreds of millions, billions of dollars. I'll build all these casinos. And they all went broke and they all failed. And so then he declares bankruptcy and gets the same loan from another bank. And finally, around 2000, all the big American banks began talking to each other and they realized they were all being scammed and refused to lend him any more money. So then he goes to Deutsche Bank and they learned after one, they still hasn't paid them back. So then where does he go to get money by the end of the first decade of the 2000s? Russian banks. And of course, you don't get to be a bank at all in Russia unless you're mob. And we all know who the head of the mob is in Russia these days. And Trump, I think he thought he didn't have to pay them back either. He'd just rip them off and go borrow from the Saudis after that or the Israelis or something. But with Putin and the head of the Russian mob, it doesn't work that way. You know, if you don't pay up, either we're going to rename that tower New York Putin Tower and then we're gonna seize Mar-a-Lago with those same little green men who took part of the Ukraine and my best hookers in the world get to run wild inside and you don't get to have any of it. You have to watch from outside the window and don't forget my agents could poison you anytime, anywhere. All alone in that bedroom, Melania won't sleep with you in in the White House where you're gorging down your fucking cheeseburgers in the middle of the night, sending out all these crazy tweets because he can't sleep. Well, we could poison those anytime. And we could even poison Ivanka too. Ha 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 ha. And that, I think, is the main reason why Donald Trump is so scared of Putin. He owes him too much money. And there's no way he can pay it. I'm so much looking forward to uh, the, I don't know, like six season Donald Trump TV series that with, uh, at some point will be produced. Uh, <laughs> and I wonder who will play Trump. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I mean, the really good character actors who are real actors, I mean, Christian Bale has played Dick Cheney as well as Batman and the American Psycho. And uh, 
Gary Oldman could do quite a Trump, I'm sure. Trump Absolutely. vicious when you go all the way back in his career. I mean, the interesting thing about Trump is that everything is kind of out already. People know what's going on. People not just, entirely, uh, not, not entirely. entirely that it's that is true, but it is uh, it is way less mysterious, let's call it, than with other presidents like Nixon, for example. Well, it it, it oh, oh Nixon was far, was far less mysterious than Trump. One of the driving forces of his anger is that he never had any money. And Trump was worth something like $4 million the second he was born. There was already an account like that for him because his daddy was so fucking rich. Um, which also means if Trump loses all his money, he will have no idea how to live. But um, no, that, that was part of Nixon's anger and stuff. The Western White House in San Clemente he had right on the beach, north of San Diego. That was somebody, I think somebody else paid for that. And then the Florida one, I think actually belonged to one of his weird little friends named B.B. Rebozo. I'm not kidding. It was B.B. Rebozo. I mean, Nixon had so few friends that the friends he did have became objects of fascination. Like this guy's actually friends with Nixon. And he just came out of nowhere. Who is this guy? <laughs> What is your favorite movie about uh, an American president? Um, I don't know about presidents. I mean, I saw three about Lyndon Johnson right in a row. Mm -hmm. And that was just uh, kind of an emotional thing for me because I have so many vivid memories of the 60s. I'm so glad that I was so interested in what was going on and interested in the music and I absorbed it all at the same time. So I know how they all cross with each other and stuff that I, I am a lot of people my age don't have any memories of any of that. Not even Watergate when we were 16 years old and the Senate investigation of Tricky Dick Nixon was the best reality TV show in history ever. And justice actually prevailed, except for Nixon going to jail. But um, at least we got him out. But so, um, and I, I've seen the Oliver Stone one on Nixon, and that wasn't bad. Um, yeah, I, I watched that for the first time just a week ago. I don't know why. That's why I actually asked you, because that was not a good movie. <laughs> have you seen 13 Days? Oh, yes, I have. The one about, yeah. uh, about I mean, the it's Cuba not crisis. really about John F. Kennedy as much as the Cuban Missile Crisis itself and how close we came to uh, you never being born, for one thing, and no punk rock because everybody was dead by then. We came that close. Mm -hmm. And uh, all I can say is you want horrifying visions. Just be glad that when the Cuban Missile Crisis hit, Nixon wasn't president. Oh yeah, then that then, would have then been a disaster. I would have died. You never would have been born. End of fucking story. And possibly <laughs> even died very slowly from all the radiation poisoning all over the atmosphere. And um, so yeah, that, there's one. Then I saw three right in a row on Lyndon Johnson because um, the guy from Breaking Bad played him, and Woody Harris Harrelson played him in another movie. And he also appears in 13 Days, of course, and some other things. And I was just trying to think, I know him, remember him so well that I, you know, okay, I'm not quite sure Harrelson is how I remember him, especially the way Harrelson was walking so slowly and having Johnson being such a decrepit old man when he really didn't seem like that to me. And then the Breaking Bad guy did his. And there's an earlier one made for TV many, many years ago that I happened to see, even though I almost never watched movies on TV or TV at all, but I saw that one with Randy Quaid, LBJ, The Early Years. And mm -hmm. that was the best Johnson I saw. And sadly, the sequel was never made. That one ended right as he's taking the oath of office on the plane right after John F. Kennedy was killed. And that is a very good, very powerful movie. 
and I wish more people could see it. It occasionally comes up on cable TV, I guess. I don't know. And then um, there's another really influential fascist and racist of the time you probably know about named George Wallace, the old governor of Alabama. Segregation now, segregation forever. That George Wallace, who ran as a third party candidate in 68 and probably cost, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say if very many Southern Democrats voted for him who would have voted for Humphrey otherwise or not, because uh, as LBJ says in one of those movies after the civil rights bill passes, we just lost the self, the South for at least the next generation. And sure enough, Nixon at the time spotted it too. And thus his so-called Southern strategy and what he called the silent majority and and whatnot, and eventually the South turned, you know, lockstep, rock-ribbed re extremist Republican, and slowly but surely they they're seeing how much more racism they can openly get away with. And of course, Trump just opened the floodgates on that one. But then other president movies, I haven't seen W yet. Um, I hope it's better. I, I think the Nixon one was that bad, but I hope it's better than that. And then um, it, it's ones where the president isn't necessarily the main one, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I saw Primary Colors, too, with John Travolta, who's not exactly, you know, a Democrat play, you know, playing a super weasley prick that's not a thinly disguised Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty good. I mean, that was the best acting job I've ever seen Travolta ever do. And it's like, oh yeah, this is this is Clinton, all right. In a weird way, it really is Clinton. Yeah. And I think I'm spacing on a big one, but I can't remember what it was. It doesn't matter. But it's it's interesting because the 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 U.S. presidency or the U.S. president is such an such a global icon. It's always interesting to see uh, how that icon, this like. Uh, this center of power is portrayed in films, and what uh, what 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 films kind of like uh, uh, stick in people's minds. I guess is always interesting. what I'd really like to see is the Soviet Union movies involving American presidents. Oh I yeah, mean, I mean I've they had their they one. had their own James Bond who did, wasn't interested in those women. He was just getting the job done for the Soviet Union and being a good Soviet and all that good stuff. And then uh, they made their own Rambo character after that movie got out of hand. Only their the villains in that one were fat cat defense fats from the American defense industry smoking cigars and plotting while they're on a golf course and you know in other words real defense industry executives yeah. and uh, I'd love to actually see those movies I'm sure there were several more involving Reagan or Nixon or their side of the Cuban Missile Crisis and there was one yeah. which even Thirteen Days points out. Perfect. I guess uh, we have already talked so long. I mean, we could keep going for hours and hours and hours, but I think maybe for our viewers, that is a good, uh, like, uh, it's, it's a homework assignment. What are your favorite uh, Soviet movies about American presidents or uh, uh, international crises uh, from the Soviet perspective? So maybe, uh, dear viewers out there, if you have some recommendations, for me and for Jello, please, uh, please send it to us. We have to be able to access it somehow too. In America, now that I think about it, there's not even very much Russian cinema over here. After the fall of communism, there's still Potemkin and Ivan the Terrible from way back when, Sergei Eisenstein and all, but that is about all we've got really. I mean, I did see one East German science fiction movie once, but you know, it was kind of a dark star sort of thing. Very low budget, almost like an old can of shaving cream being thrust across some stars or something. It was that cheap. No. And but there's, uh, it was, there's good it stuff. was there's boring. Good stuff, yeah. It was boring. And then another one that's kind of a it's sort of a juvenile delinquency movie, and I would classify it as a film noir, too. Berlin Schoenhauser Corner. 
that was a DDR movie. And there's even a little bit of rock and roll in it. It's a juvenile delinquency movie about this kid who keeps running, crossing over to West Berlin. There's no wall yet and gets involved with this evil capitalists, you know, capitalist gangsters as if there was any other kind in the eyes of DDR film officially unsanctioned DDR movies, eventually he gets in a ton of trouble, sees the error of his ways, and comes back vowing never to set foot in West Berlin again, and that communism is the way to go. At least state communism. I mean, the production like value is good enough that it's a watchable movie and everything. And then of course the, the message at the end is the only message you get in any movie from there. Oh yeah, yeah. There was a big purge in the 19, mid 1960s, I think. Uh, of course they had, uh, they had various uh, forms of uh, commissions and stuff like that. But one of my favorite films from, from the DDR is called uh, Jacob the Liar, Jakob the Lügner. And it was uh, uh, not published in the mid 60s. It should have been. It was created, uh, but it was never put. Uh, uh, never it was never released. put out because because the commission said like now we cannot show that because uh, the basic idea is like how uh, a Jewish uh, a Jewish man uh, is is using, so to speak, the power of lying to make people feel better. So he was lying about the situation of the Jewish people uh, during World War II. And he was, he was giving hope to his, uh, to his people by, by lying about the truth. Uh, and it's a really, really uh, wonderful, very, very harrowing and, and, and sad movie. But for the DDR guys, uh, it wasn't active enough. You know, It was not a film how the anti-fascist state or her anti-fascism was fighting the nazis it was just like this like a uh, witty little jewish character doing good things and it was so it wasn't a, it wasn't a thinly veiled movie against the east german government no it was not it was not it was not but it was published a couple of years later and there is a really bad remake of it with robin williams from the from the i think like 90s or something like that it's horrible oh Just don't watch the don't watch the wow. remake uh yeah anyway well, another thing that is funny yeah. is 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 the very idea of ddr beach party movies Oh, I hope all those people were naked because if uh, not, no, they were not. <laughs> Although it's <laughs> amazing this movie, this movie you tell me about, um, that that the prints at least survived and they didn't burn them or anything. Unlike what Hollywood did to all those orgy scenes in the von Stroheim movies in the twenties that are lost forever because of that. But uh, okay, and I wasn't listening. There really was a nudist thing going on in communist East Germany. In the oh yeah, 60s. absolutely. Yeah, the Freikörperkultur, FKK, Freikörperkultur, so like the freedom of the body culture. Uh, and uh, so nudist beaching and, and swimming was a big thing uh, in Eastern Germany. Supposedly it was in Germany for a little bit in the 1920s too. I'm not, I mean, I would not be I've surprised. I've seen pictures. But, I've yeah. seen both illustrations and photos of that. It was a back to nature thing, complete with hippie hair and beards. Oh, maybe that wouldn't really surprise me at all. Because, I mean, especially the 1920s and 1930s in Germany, that was a wild era. And, I mean, uh, I mean we knew how that ended. But right. I mean, there was a lot of social uproar. There was a lo lot of social uh, uh, experimenting going on. Uh, there were culture clashes you couldn't imagine, I guess. Some really decadent art in the eyes of Hitler where he had to get rid of all of it and the people who did it. No, yeah, uh, ab absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I wonder what some of it was that we missed out on too. I mean, they most think, of it I is think... actually documented. So as far as I know uh, that the Nazis were pretty, pretty strict about documenting what they did. So uh, I think we know pretty well what got destroyed and what I not. see. I yeah. see. Yeah. yeah, the other the other thing about the, the, the beach party movies and the DDR was, I believe, at least one of them, if not a lot of them, featured an American who defected over there named Dean Reed. 
Mm -hmm. You don't know about Dean Reed? No. The East German Elvis, maybe the communist world Elvis. I don't know. And he was originally a Hollywood kind of teeny bopper, Frankie Avalon, Pat Boone kind of rocker, who even had a song called Female Hercules. But then after a while, to hell with Hollywood. I'm defecting to East Germany. And off he went. Where he still made rock and roll stuff as well as John Denverish things would always have a song or two on it about how great communism was in English. And because he was not German, he could go in and out and he could travel. So he had a following in South America too. Oh, that and makes weirder, sense now. Th I there's... think there is a movie about him from over there. I mean, now, there too. is. And then, and then somebody in Hollywood is trying to get one made as well. And I am told by a pretty reliable source, though I have not actually seen it, that Dean Reed is buried about 15 minutes walk or less from the house I grew up in in Boulder, Colorado. Interesting. Next time I'm there, I have to check that out. I mean, there is uh, one, one of the last uh, Coen Brothers movies, the one about 1950s uh, Hollywood with, with George Clooney uh, playing this like Spartacus character. There is this one subplot in it where uh, this like um, kind of like uh, 1940s, 1950s musical singer, dancer, like Fred Astaire character, and he defects to the Soviet Union. So he swims out like, uh, like in a boat and this like giant uh, Soviet submarine picks him up and he does his dance moves on the, on the submarine. And, uh, and Dolph Lundgren is uh, the guy, is, is the, the, Soviet, uh, uh, wow. the Soviet captain of the submarine. Good God. So What's I'm the pretty name sure of that's- Coen Brothers movie? I don't think I've ever heard of it. I haven't seen it. It's just like recent. It's like, it's probably not even five years old. It's, uh, I forgot the name of it, but it's, uh, it's, it's the Coen Brothers one about 1950s Hollywood. And then, uh, yeah, it's about a fixer of working uh, for uh, a, a big Hollywood studio who is trying to keep all the, the bad press away from the starlets and all that stuff. And yeah, when one of the subplots is pretty much like, uh, yeah, one of the stars of that Hollywood studio defecting to the Soviet Union. Wow. I don't know if Dean Reed was in American movies. I've never even Googled him or anything, <laughs> but um, gotten weird looks for buying his albums and uh, used record stores in Leipzig. What do you want that for? <laughs> like, you have no idea how weird this guy is to me. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm pretty sure you got a lot of crazy looks in your lifetime uh, about weird things that you bought. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm so sorry that we can't share that with our audience for hours and hours to go. But uh, I think I, I I think we should stop here. Okay. <laughs> I think it's a good it's a good thing. Just make sure you text or email me the name of that Coen Brothers movie. Oh yes, yes. I'll, I'll 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 help you with that. No no problem. Cool. I think it's just like like a little little uh, checkup on IMDb, and we we know it. George Clooney. I think it's the only George Clooney film uh, made by the Coen Brothers. So it's uh, no, because I've seen one that he's in, and it ain't that one. Oh no, there's another one. There's a second one with George Clooney and the Coen Brothers where he builds the the sex machine. Uh, burn after My, reading that's not the one it's the other one but yeah. okay that makes three Clooney's. okay anyway um all right good to know and always nice to talk to your computer face and things it is a little bit different <laughs> than phone and email so it's always nice to see you my friend absolutely and we are trying to bring you over to frankfurt to the to the b3 biennial if it's not possible 2021 then hopefully 2022 but we'll make it happen. It that was might great be having more you. likely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm, I, I've decided for now, I'm not even going to perform at all in 2021. I don't care if people think the punk festivals are starting back up in August or anything. I am not going anywhere until I feel safe going to someone else's show without a mask on. Yeah. That, Otherwise, that's good thinking. forget it. 
good thinking. Yeah. I have enough work at home, so I don't need to perform anyway. So I finish my, I finish my <laughs> movies, lots of editing it. work and all that stuff. So, so how do you I, do I to kill time? Going. Time is COVID. I don't have time to kill. I've always fucking slammed with shit. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, uh, I same, same feeling here. <laughs> so all right. wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Jello, for having time. Uh, it's in the middle of the night now for you, but I mean, I guess the middle of the night is oh, your it's perfect. More, it's closer to the morning, although I guess the sun ain't up for another couple of hours. But yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'm Thank usually you so up much. This time anyway. uh, uh, best wishes. Uh, keep going. What can I say? Uh, uh, still, still be the media in the future. <laughs> And, oh yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you so and, much. And don't forget, it hasn't all gone stale. There is satire still in this world. You and me being perfect examples. I mean, all I had to do for the Tea Party revenge porn song was just list all the Tea Party conspiracy theories, and th and then do the laughing from there. Yeah. So yeah, the fear, the the. The, the the ghost of uh, the ghost of future punk. Uh -huh. There you go. There we go. All it's still right. there. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> Take care. I'm gonna click leave. Hey folks and dear ladies and gentlemen of whatever gender you prefer, that was another episode of B3 in depth. If you want to see future episodes, please subscribe somewhere down here. I hope to see you in the future and I hope you join the debate. Thanks.